Okay, today I'm going to be taking a look at some story creation using a tool like uh, ChatGPT. You can use other AI tools or even your own templates, however you want to do that. There's a couple things to consider. So one, I'm going to be creating this mostly for Fantasy Grounds. Obviously, that's the main thing. But I wanted to show you how I came about this and what types of things you might go through if you have a paid account with ChatGPT. So when I was first starting this journey, I was kind of creating adventures on the fly, and I really didn't understand how ChatGPT worked, and I still don't quite understand it, but I'm getting a little bit better at it, and I'm starting to understand the value of what a sort of tool this can um, be for if you're designing stuff or creating content for any rule set. It doesn't have to be D&D. &D. It could be any particular rule set that you want. But essentially, what I'm going to be doing is showing you some of the steps, some of the resources that I went through when I was creating this content. So this is basically um, geared more towards adventure writing, but it also will touch on like how do you make this stuff work for you. So that's really the where the work comes in. And it is one of the things that you might face if you're going to be using chat GPT. Um, so using AI isn't the only tool. There are lots of really good published books out there. Kobold Press has one, uh, Frog God Games. And if you subscribe to John Four, he's also done books. There's uh, another one uh, called uh, uh, Writing Adventures That Don't Suck. So there's a whole bunch of books out. Uh, Sly Flourish, The Lazy GM, all those kind of resources would help you with creating adventures. However, if you want to incorporate it into ChatGPT, you can. So I'm going to kind of give you an idea of how you can do it. And, and keep in mind that this is only for my personal use. I wouldn't put this up for public consumption. You know, I wouldn't do that because a lot of the material that I might use might be copyright or, you know, will belong to somebody. So um, this is uh, basically kind of like a way to kind of speed up your process, essentially. So I wanted to put that disclaimer out there. So just keep in mind that this is for personal use, not for selling or for, you know, making profit off of somebody else's work. So essentially um, what you'll be faced with is here I've done a lot of research. So I'm in a, um, actually this is where I started an adventure. So I'm going to actually go all the way back to the beginning and kind of show you my journey here. So my question to ChatGPT before I even make anything is help me create the best D&D, 5e, and RPG introductory module ever. Use my data and research this. I will need a premise, a setting, a villain, some challenges, four pre-gen characters at level three with full background stories, and plenty of details about the adventures, the environment, and the purpose of the quest. Let's set this up as a dungeon crawl adventure that can be played in two to three sessions or about nine to 12 hours at the most. Uh, you will assist me with the outline, the organization, and some of the creative aspects of the writing. You will write with a professional, creative, and effective adventure design and as a, as a writer. You can make suggestions based upon the context and the progress, I'm supposed to say, of our adventure project. We also need a working title. So that was my initial prompt. I figured that's detailed enough. It's direct. I'd asked it what I wanted. I didn't just say, let's write an adventure. You do that, and it, it kind of takes you all over the place. You kind of have to have some focus. So what I had done is gone online previously, before I'd even went to this, and I started looking around at what kind of resources are out there. So if you have you know access to the Internet, you essentially can get something like this. This is the ultimate room guide to the ultimate guide to room to five room dungeons. And you can get this free if you sign up for John Four's website. But essentially these are templates and things that you can use to help you. So what it will do is it gives you five room dungeon formats for any type of adventure. Wilderness, exploration, city, town, adventures, role-playing adventures, science fiction, modern, steampunk, anime, all these others, and then all game systems such as the, the you know, D&D, Pathfinder, Savage Worlds. And then each room in the five-room dungeon template gives you, uh, you know, the stages of building a complete adventure. So it's kind of like, hey, this is kind of cool. So basically, I took this information and from this page 
and I plug this in. So if I go to copy, you can take this website and plug it into the chat GPT and use that as kind of like a basis for some of my research. So if I come over here, I might actually, um, I'll tell chat GPT to re research the web page and summarize. So this was my initial steps. I went through a bunch of these um, catalogs and, and books and such, and those give me um, you know, some starting points as to the types of adventures I want to write. So I was asking it, you know, how do I do this? And then I'm also supplying it with tools and not just relying on ChatGPT. So I'm giving it websites, giving it content. I even wrote up my own documents. So I have a, uh, this is the best way to do it is you'd want to take and put uh, this kind of thing together. So this is like my adventure design resources. So you you would basically have the emotional touchstone, the room dungeon model, campaign premise writing, player agency, and then you get into this legal stuff. And then, so you kind of have all that too to add to this. But the adventure design um, basically creates uh, kind of like a resource tool for ChatGPT to pull on if it needs to check or verify something. And this just goes into the document. It gets uploaded to the back end of ChatGPT. So if you have a paid account, you can upload this document if I export it as a text file. And I can load that in the background and have it run this as a uh, kind of like a, a template or like a starting point. And then when you're going to uh, do research for like designing a venture, you've already got a lot of that question and answer stuff out of the way. So this is going to give it answers or content that is, you know, basically designed around your question. And this is a kind of a starting point that you might come up with before you actually start writing your venture and before you create your own custom chat GPT. And by the way, that chat GPT store has just launched. I'm not sure how it works, but I'm, I'm going to check it out. So this is basically, um, it gave me an error, so it wasn't able to um, give me the summary. But basically, this can summarize web pages and attachments. So you can even upload a PDF or a text file, as long as it's not too giant. When I mean giant, like over about 100 pages. So you probably just want to have a smaller piece, or you can copy and paste maybe like half of the of the uh, yeah, it's giving me error. So it could be that uh, that it can't um, use the analyzing. So here's adventure. Now it's going to my data. So it couldn't research what I asked it to. So now it's coming up with some content from the data that I provided it in the background. So this is just a way that you can kind of back up what you're doing. So you not only are you giving it content but you're also giving it um, kind of like a foundation to work on. So if that doesn't work, you can always, you know, upload um, documents. So I just got the free download of basically, um, yeah, it wasn't able to access that web page. So they, that web page could be blocked um, if, you know, there are some websites that you can't do that with, but you can use wiki guides. You can use all kinds of different resources. Sometimes Reddit, if it can get on there and crawl through there, it will do that. So let me see. So subscribe. Let's see. What is this doing? Yeah. So it's, see, I, I didn't even give it a web page. So that's probably why it's tweaking out. Let me see if it will, um, if it'll still. So here's the website. And. What I'm going to do is go back to the chat GPT, plug that back in and see if that'll come up. So this is the website where I got the free PDF and it has quite a bit. So, so yeah, it says I cannot directly um, access it, but it'll say this, right? Because it's not really um, designed to, you know, copy and paste exactly word for word, but it is giving me some stuff here. So, it gives me a, a adventure design. It's given me some information about how to make this stuff work. Uh, it tells you how to structure content. So I also downloaded the PDF, the actual free P PDF that, that is offered on the website. So if I come over to, um, I'm going to go over to my, my library here 
and I think it's in the documents or maybe the downloads folder. I didn't look where it actually saved, so I'm gonna, it's going to take me a second here. But essentially, once you have all your resources, you're going to um, go through them, organize them, upload them into ChatGPT, and use those as starting points. So you don't have to start from scratch every time you work on a project, because that can be uh, very disheartening, and it can, you know, it can really be annoying uh, if you don't have something to start with. So that's that's something that you'll have to kind of discover on your own as you go through this. But essentially, this is going to um, could potentially make things a little easier on you, depending on what you're trying to do, what kind of content you're making or how you want to approach the adventure writing. Some some of us want something really simple. We just want the adventure. We don't want all this stuff. But um, I found that if you do a little bit of this work up front, like doing your research, figuring out your template, what type of content you want, the formatting you want, all those sort of things, it really makes this job a lot easier on the back end. So yeah, so I'm just kind of struggling. You know, I got problems. I got things that aren't coming out the way I want it to, but here's the five room dungeons and here's adventure template. So these are two documents that I had found that were free that basically I'm able to upload these. And what I'm going to do is ask it to analyze and um, summarize. So it, it can actually go through these if they're not too big. And it will take that information and kind of put it in its memory. But it's better if you load these up in the back end of as a permanent type thing so that each time you call up that tool, you're not having to up re-upload it every time. But I want to take a look at the, the actual PDF to see how big this is because that might be a monumental task for it if you give it too large of a um, document. So if I come over here and go to this five room dungeons, it's got pictures in it and all kinds of stuff. So this may not have been a good idea to upload this, but this is all these resources that you would have for creating different content. So you could take something like this, doesn't have to be this document. It could be whatever document you want, something that you made up yourself, something that you researched, but you can take all the text out of here. Yeah, this is 300 pages. So this is probably not a good idea, but maybe go through chapter by chapter and put those things in and then build your own documents. You don't want to copy it verbatim, but it looks like it's trying to. So it's taking a look at how this thing is set up. It's trying to give me some kind of um, kind of documentation. I can query the, the PDFs to help me design, format, create, you know, all those sort of things. So this isn't giving me a whole lot because I haven't uploaded in the back end and I try to give it too much at once. So that's part of the, the problem why it didn't give me anything. But you want to give it smaller bites than that. This is this one right here was too much. That was over 300 pages. So that was that was my bad for not um, checking the source. And on top of that, if you wanted to monetize something like that, you couldn't just take someone's work upload it and then strip it strip it out and then use it as your own so you have to kind of be careful with that but nonetheless i asked chat gpt to help me design adventure so what it came up with is the shadows of the forgotten crypt uh, it says the adventure begins in the small peaceful town of eldenford nestled at the edge of the ominous verdant woods recently strange occurrences and disappearances have plagued the town traced back to the ancient uh, crypt of the forgotten hero rumored to be buried deep within the woods so then it gave me the setting it says eldon ford is a quaint town known for its friendly inhabitants and annual harvest festivals the verdant woods is a dense mysterious forest that becomes darker and more twisted as one ventures deeper the crypt is an ancient underground mausoleum filled with puzzles traps and secrets so that's kind of your Kind of cliche there. I mean, it's kind of got that five-room dungeon feel to it, kind of. Uh, actually, less than that. But it's got, like, three main areas. You got the town, you got the forest, and you got the temple. So then you have a villain. So the villain was named Morwen the Soul Weaver, an undead sorcerer. Background. He was once a revered hero, now seeks to transcend death by binding the souls of the living. So these are the challenges that it gave me initially. Uh, navigate through the deceptive and treacherous terrain of the verdant woods, 
overcoming traps and puzzles within the crypt, battling Morrowind's minions like undead creatures, ensnared woodland beasts, and spectral guardians, and the final con confrontation would be with Morwen in the crypt's deepest chamber. So I thought that's a pretty good start. And then it gave me some pregents. So Sir Alric, the human paladin, uh, Leah Willow Glen, an elf ranger, Milo Thimblefoot, a halfling rogue, and Ezra Spellweave, the human wizard. So it gave me a basic four party group thing. And then it gives me some adventure details where it says the quest to uncover the source of the town's disturbances leads to the crypt. Environmental descriptions like Eerie Woods, the Decaying Crypt, Enchanted Chambers, uh, role-playing opportunities with town folk and the trap spirits that you might come upon, clues and lore about Morwen's past and the crypt's history. And then number seven uh, gives me the uh, you have to the purpose of this. You have to stop Morwen from completing a dark ritual that would unleash an undead scourge upon the world to bring peace to the restless spirits within the crypt and to protect Elden for and cover the forgotten history of the hero turned villain. So it gives you a pretty good starting point, right? So I thought that wasn't too bad. It's a little cliche, but not bad. For for just like not giving it a whole lot of parameters, it gave me the details. I just gave it the outline. And I said, okay, I want you to make me an adventure. This is, you know, the settings for it as far as, you know, the parameters, the formatting. So now the outline and organization. So we're going to introduce. Uh, the introduction is basically going to be a scene in Elden Ford. We're going to introduce key NPCs and present the initial quest. There will be a journey to the crypt. We have to go through the woods, encountering obstacles and clues. The crypt itself, you'll explore the crypt's levels, solving puzzles, battling foes. The climax would be to confront Morwen with potential for both combat and negotiation, which which I kind of like. It's got an optional ending. And resolve the fate of the crypt, Elden Ford and the other characters. So that's your resolution. So then it gave me some some ideas. Flesh out the NPCs and the crypt. Detail the layout and the challenges of the crypt. Develop the backstory and motivations for Morwen and create stat blocks and equipment for the pre-gen characters. So that's essentially what I did as I, I went through this. And so I said, okay, the main PCs are mostly immigrants and a few people that were born and raised in the town or close by. And I gave it some ideas. So there's a town elder, it's native. There's a barkeeper that's been there for 15 years. There's a tack and harness person uh, that's been there 10 years. Blacksmith, eight years. Uh, the trade and barter store was that's a native family that's been in town. The town militia leader is native. A local lawman is an eight-year immigrant with ten militia, four guards, two deputies, one lieutenant, mostly all native to the town. And then there's the local temple, which is a five-year immigrant and his helper. So that's basically the rough idea of the, what's who's in town, maybe the potential people that you need to see before the adventure starts. So then it, go ahead, it went ahead and organized that for me. So it said, uh, gave me some names. So Town Elder, Native, Adric the Wise. You got the Barkeeper, Greta and Ivan Marrow. So it's like a couple. Tack and Harness Shop Owners, the, the Rivenhall Siblings, Cora and Nils. And then uh, there's a Blacksmith, um, Brogan Ironhand, probably a dwarf or some sort of uh, maybe a half-orc. There's a Trade-In Barter Store. And the owner is uh, Elspeth Green. So it kind of went through and gave me a lot of those starting points. And I think one of the hardest ones is to come up with these names. I do notice that if you don't specify a name, it will reuse names sometimes. So that is a, a fallback that I hope that someday it can get over that. But uh, not all these names are redone. But I've seen this Ulrich Thorn somewhere else when it helped me. And I've seen it repeat like certain types of um, topics because I'm asking it the exact same questions. So if you reword the question or you ask it not to give you cliche names or stolen names from other settings, that sort of thing, it will do that. You just have to kind of mention that when you ask for it. So then it kind of gives me the, the town's defense. Uh, so the militia, the guards, the deputies, and the lieutenant. So it says these characters can be woven into the adventure, providing quests, information, services, local color, 
The mix of immigrants and natives also offers opportunities for a diverse culture, stories, worldviews, enriching the role-playing experience. So then what I did is I said, well, I, I made a comment here. So I'm kind of showing you the back and forth, like how I came up with this and, and the steps that, that went into this. Because this is the actual work part of it. The fun part is taking all the, the good stuff and copying and pasting it into Fantasy Grounds. This is where you actually are creating with ChatGPT, kind of helping you out. So I said, well, the crypt was part of a long gone ancient civilization. The original founders of the town were miners, adventurers, and the occasional drifter. Mormon was born and alive long before any of the townsfolk were around. He is a sole survivor from his past and history. So something cataclysmic happened before the town was even founded. So it says incorporating this into the rich backstory in the adventure adds layers of history and mystery. Let's flesh them out. So it says, okay, this crypt background, the crypt was built by a long lost civilization known for its advanced knowledge in arcane arts and architecture. The civilization vanished mysteriously, leaving behind only a few ruins like the crypt. So this is kind of like going along the lines of developing the content that's part of the, the adventure. Then there's the town's origin. The founders, Eldon Ford, was established by miners, uh, adventurers, and drifters who discovered rich resources in the area. Over time, it grew into a peaceful town it is today. So you don't have to use all this stuff, but it really gives you a foundation. Uh, mining history. So the town's early economy was driven mostly by mining, perhaps even leading to the discovery of the crypt during an excavation. Uh, cultural melting pot. So the mix of backgrounds among the founders created a diverse and robust community with traditions and stories passed down through generations. So I like how it said maybe they had found the crypt entrance long ago when they were still when the town was being found. So that's kind of cool. That gives you kind of a way to bridge those two locations together with some history and not just something recent. So that could be something that you may tie in at a different part of the adventure, or maybe the adventurers have to work for that information. Maybe somebody in the town was a relative of somebody who was a relative of somebody who had gone to that crypt. Who knows? So that's kind of convenient, but it is kind of cool too. So Marwin's history, the guy, the big bad evil guy, is that he predates the current townsfolk and even their ancestors. He hails from the same era as an ancient civilization that built the crypt. So this is thousands of years ago. Um, he's a sole survivor of his time, carrying with him centuries of knowledge, power, and bitterness. Uh, his transformation. So initially he was a hero or a significant figure of his civilization or time. A series of tragic events or pursuit of forbidden knowledge led him to become the undead sorcerer now threatening Elden Ford. So his history and what he was involved with long ago has kind of evolved into this, uh, this supervillain. Integrating history into the adventure. So you might have ancient relics. So you might find an ancient relic or something in the crypt that talks more about the ancient civilization that it's tied to. Uh, Morrowind's motivations. Um, his actions are driven by complex history, possibly involving the lost civilization's downfall. The town's relationship with the crypt. The founders might have known that the crypt, uh, but kept its existence secret to protect the town. So there's probably only a few people that are aware of it. Environmental storytelling. So the design of the crypt, its traps, and the creatures within it can tell a story about the ancient civilization and Morwen's past. So there are lots of different elements here to kind of give you a starting point. So it sets the stage for the adventure. It also leaves room for expansions and sequels. Uh, players could explore more of the areas and, 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 you know, look at the ancient civilization more. They can learn about Morrowind's transformation. Maybe there's a journal or some old scrolls that talk about it. And then, of course, the origins of the town itself. So there's some room for exploration, discovery, role play, not just combat. So that's kind of cool. You got a little bit of that. You know, I think if you made this like 70-30, 60-40 kind of thing, or maybe if you want to do all three pillars, Maybe, you know, 10% exploration, 30% um, role play, and 60% combat, you know, something like that. So I asked it to develop Morrowind's origins and why only he had survived or withstood the ravages of time. What happened to his people? 
So then it says, well, we're going to develop this compelling backstory. It, we're going to delve into his origins, the fate of the people, and the unique circumstances that led to his survival and transformation. So now it's evolving. Now we're getting more insight into the main character. And I do like the fact that it's a little bit more detailed because a lot of times you get this big, bad, evil guy with no background, hardly any history at all. There's nothing to go on. I mean, if it gives you 10 things, you don't have to use all 10 of them. But if it gives you nothing, you're you're sitting there, especially if you're new to role-playing games, you have nothing to go on. So it's really hard to come up with something if there's nothing there. That takes a lot of time, practice, experience, and luck to do that during a game. So if you're running a game, it doesn't give you much content. If you've been around for a while, you know what, what I'm saying. It's really difficult to come up with something on the spot sometimes. And sometimes it just works. Like you'll click, you make something up, it happens. And, it, and a whole story is built around it. Then other times you're kind of floundering around like, crap, I don't, I'm not prepared. I don't know what's going on. So it's nice to have a lot of this stuff in the background so that you, you, know, you can build upon it. So Morwen's origins and the fall of his civilization. So the ancient civilizations were part of a highly advanced and arcane civilization. We knew that. They were renowned for their mastery of magic, particularly in the realms of soul binding and necromancy, which they had believed held the key to immortality and ultimate knowledge. So they were all kind of all about life and death. Marwin's role as a respected leader and a powerful sorcerer at the time, uh, he was at the forefront of this arcane research. He was deeply devoted to his people and their pursuit of transcending the mortal limits. So then there was a catastrophe. The civilization's relentless pursuit of arcane power led to a catastrophic event. A grand experiment to achieve immortality went awry, unleashing a devastating magical maelstrom. This disaster obliterated much of their population and fractured the very fabric of their reality. So it really caused problems. Uh, so it left behind only ruins and a few scattered remnants of their existence. So something big went down. So Morwen's survival, he survived because he was the epicenter of the experiment. The magic unleashed, um, it bound his soul to the land, making him undead. While he gained a form of immortality, it came with the cost of witnessing the destruction of everything he held dear. So that's a kind of a guilt thing that you got to live with. And if you ever live with guilt, that's a SOB right there. That's a son of a gun there. Uh, isolation and transformation. So over the centuries, his guilt and solitude warped his mind. His noble intentions turned into an obsession with death and the soul. He began to believe that he could undo the past or resurrect his fallen civilization by mastering the very magic that destroyed it. So he's on this pursuit to, to undo what he did, basically. So the impact on his psyche was very weighty. So the weight of the centuries, the isolation, and the constant exposure to dark magic deeply affected his psyche. He became what he once fought against, a manipulator of souls and a binder of the undead. So that's how he became a necromancer. That is exactly the type of thing that helps you understand the motives, the plot, and the, the adventure design behind the character. It's almost like the vampire from Curse of Strahd or Ravenloft Strahd. He has that kind of backstory, and that's what really makes that adventure. He's got a soul. He's got a purpose. He's got all these details. That's what makes that adventure cool. It's not just about the, the gothic horror element. It's the fact that he has a story, and that really matters in a lot of adventures. A one-shot, you probably wouldn't have to get as deep into this. You might just kind of gloss over some of this stuff and kind of leave it loose. Because you're not going to spend a lot of time here. You're probably going to be here a few hours. You're going to go somewhere, kick some ass, and get out. That's basically what, what you do in a one-shot. But in this case, this is kind of getting almost into the campaign setting, but more like an adventure. And this, like I said, I asked it to create something that you can complete in 9 to 12 hours. So maybe three or four sessions. So integrate into the adventure. So the artifacts and lore, you can kind of, um, you know, you can do that. You can, you can have that sort of thing, um, you know, kind of pick up the pieces where the lost civilization was. So you'll learn more about Morwen potentially, the civilization that he, he represented, 
and maybe get some insight into the tragic history. There was some moral complexity here. Morwen isn't really straightforward, just a villain. His tragic past and noble intentions kind of went wrong, so that kind of adds to his characters. He's not completely evil, but he's nuts, basically. Uh, potential, potential for redemption. So the possibility of redeeming Morwen or helping him find peace could potentially be a compelling narrative arc if you wanted to, to go that route. I really like that suggestion because it, it may not come down to killing the guy at the end. That's what most people want to do. But if you really wanted to keep this adventure going or you wanted to make more sense out of it or, you know, maybe get some more role play out of it before you kill him, that might be a thing. So Marwin's story intertwines with the themes of loss, obsession, and the consequences of unchecked power. It provides a rich narrative backdrop for the adventurers to explore filled with moral quandaries and the lingering mystery of a forgotten civilization. So I, that's already a decent start for the adventure. So Morwen, um, I put, I wrote this part. So Morwen in desperate measures has used the dead of his ancestors and previous explorers, miners, lost individuals, and adventurers to fill the ranks for his undead servants and guardians. As a protection and caution, he has pockets of undead and natural deterrence to protect his lair and his home. So he's kind of concerned. He doesn't want people bothering him. He doesn't want them around there. So what I what I, it did is it said, we'll use some servants and guardians. So we started building out the content. So he has uh, ancestors, ancestral spirits, um, victims of the past, some undead vari varieties, so these are going to be things that you can use to kind of fill the dungeon and to kind of give it a little bit more oomph. So Morrowin was driven by desperation and guilt over his lost civilization. So he had resurrected some of the spirits of his ancestors. He got so lonely and weirded out that that's what he did. So these undead beings, once proud members of a society, now roam the crypt as spectral guardians bound to Morrowin's will. So that's kind of a weird thing gone wrong. Victims of the past. So the crypt has been a final resting place for many over the centuries, like miners, explorers, travelers, adventurers, all that kind of stuff. So uh, Morwen has reanimated these individuals, using them as sentinels to deter intruders and protect his secrets. So there's a reason why they're there. They're placed there. You know, there's that's kind of nice that you kind of have a reason why these monsters exist. And then there's some undead varieties where the crypt's guardians vary in form and ability, ranging from simple skeletons and zombies to more formidable wraiths and specters, each bearing remnants of their past lives. So depending on who they were and what happened to them during the cataclysm or, or during their death will determine how powerful they are and how they're tied into the plot. Uh, natural deterrence. So there's some arcane traps. So he's probably set up a couple of glyphs that will trigger... Uh, maybe hazards or illusions to kind of disorient people or get them lost. Uh, enchanted flora and fauna. So the area surrounding the crypt, especially in the woods that are around there, it's home to plants and creatures twisted by the magic. So maybe some weird vines or maybe some creepy evil trees or thorn vines that entangled po uh, poisonous mushrooms, predatory, be predatory beasts, and unnatural that have unnatural abilities for like a first line defense, like a deterrent. And then of course the crypt itself is kind of in a treacherous place. It's got unstable architecture, collapsing tunnels, areas that are flooded with toxic gases or even necrotic energy from the remnants of the ancient civilization's downfall. So there's all kinds of room for not just combat, but also challenges, traps, puzzles, that sort of thing. So that's where that comes in. And then it tells you kind of like this is a suggestion on how to integrate it. So you have combat encounters, uh, varieties of undead, and natural hazards, providing numerous opportunities for combat encounters, each requiring different strategies and tactics. Uh, the moral implications would be that when you encounter the reanimated remains of past explorers and possibly ancestors, they might pose a moral dilemma for the character, such as looting their bodies and that kind of stuff, or even destroying people who didn't have a choice. Uh, the narrative depth is that the guardians and deterrents are not just obstacles, but also storytelling elements, each holding a piece of the crypt's tragic history. So I would go in and probably develop a little bit more 
on the different types of undead and maybe they were a certain class or a certain type of people or maybe they were elite or nobles or something like that. But the elements are going to be put in place to make Morwen's Lair become a place of both danger and sorrow filled with remnants of a once great civilization and the souls caught up in its downfall. The setting not only challenges the player's combat and problem-solving skills, but also engages them in the crypt's tragic narrative. That's exactly what you want. You want this kind of overarching story kind of background. Then you want some pieces and parts of the adventure where you can actually engage with it, like talk to them or, or fight them and that sort of thing. And then, of course, you'll find treasures and you know traps and stuff like that. That's exactly what you'd want out of an adventure. So then I wrote that Morwen has recently attracted, this is where things, or a twist comes. So that's like a, a basic adventure, right? And then I, I threw a left curve at it. I said, okay, this is, this is kind of getting too cliche, kind of predictable, kind of boring. So now I added in that Morwen has recently attracted a young fledgling vampire to his lair. Initially, there was a confrontation, but Morwen then saw her as a potential asset. So she stumbled upon this, this lair to hide out. She had recently been turned into a vampire, like maybe a, less than a year, and has since shunned and fled from her master. So she's on the run. She's been chased by her former master, so she tried to hide in Morwen's lair. Morwen now harbors a refugee, or, or you know, basically a, a runaway, and his lair helps protect her from her master's wrath. As a service, she will inform Morwen as to the happenings outside his lair when she feeds. So she goes out at certain times, and if she sees anything or spies, she'll let him know. Usually at dawn, she's returned to rest and reports to Morwen about her night. Generally, she's off in the forest feeding on animals and stuff because she hasn't quite embraced her vampirehood or vampireness. So she's kind of hiding out in his lair, kind of using him and also using this as a place to get a breather because she's trying to get away from her master. She doesn't want to be under his control. So the addition of the young fledgling Vampirus introduces intriguing dynamics into Morwen's lair and the overall narrative of the adventure. So now this throws a whole nother angle into this and it can potentially expand the adventure even more. So when you do this, you kind of want to do it smoothly, and I don't know how smooth this is, but it's like everything was going normal or, or predictable, and then all of a sudden, bam, this happens. So this is fairly recent. So, you know, it's not like it's been like this for hundreds of years, maybe several months. So the addition of her kind of throws a wrench in the, the normal narrative. So this would kind of throw off the adventures, too. People that are used to doing these dungeon dells would say, what the hell is this? You got this this vampire who's well, who is she about what is, what is she all about so you have this basic adventure outline and then you throw in this left hook and this is kind of like this beautiful vampire comes out of nowhere and now she's kind of thrown a wrench into things so basically this fledgling vampirus is running away from her master or whoever created her and she's basically on the run she's not happy she's scared She's not fully embraced her vampire hood. She's feeding on animals. She's still not quite there yet. So she was once a noblewoman from a distant land. She was turned into a vampire against her will. Struggling to uh, come to terms with her new existence, she fled from her master, seeking refuge in a place to hide. Uh, at her initial encounter with Morwen, uh, her intrusion into his lair led to a confrontation. However, Morwen soon recognized her unique abilities in her situation. He offered her sanctuary. In return, Lysander agreed to serve as his informant. So she can go out occasionally and check things out beyond his lair. He can't really leave that area, and the players don't really know that, but he's kind of kind of stuck in that. He can go outside, but he just can't wander off too far. Um, so roles and abilities. So Lysandra ventures out into the night to gather information and feed. She reports back to Morwen about local happenings, movements of her former master's agents, and other relevant news. Her vampiric power. So as a vampire, she possesses enhanced strength, speed, and senses, along with the ability to charm and manipulate. However, being a fledgling, her control over these powers is still developing, so she's still kind of green. 
So conflict and motivation. So evading her master is her main thing. Lysandra is constantly on the run from her former master, a powerful and vengeful vampire lord, seeking redemption. So she's tormented by her vampiric natures, not not really sitting well with her. She seeks redemption and maybe a cure for her condition. So interaction with the player. So potentially she could be an ally or an adversary, depending on how the players approach her and how she's presented in the game. And Lysandra could become a valuable ally or even a reluctant adversary. So it really depends on on how things play out in the game. It doesn't have to be one way or the other. It just depends on the way direction you go. The source of information. So she can provide insights into Morwen's activities and the crypt secrets. So that would be something that her main function is. And her personal quest may be that uh, players might choose to help confront her past and find a cure for her affliction. So that could be something that they would work out maybe after the adventure or something. So integrating this, you got this moral complexity. It adds a lot of um, more to the story. And it challenges the players to navigate the nuances of her situation. So it isn't just you fighting a vampire. Now you got this young pretty vampire girl on the run that's not happy with being a vampire but she's under the thumb of this Morwen guy because she's promised him that you know I'll help protect your lair and I'll help you spy on people and stuff but you know so it's kind of a mess Uh, so her story intertwines with Morwen's offering potential side quests and deeper exploration into the theme of unintended consequences Uh, for dynamic encounters her vampiric nature and her conflict with her master can lead to dynamic encounters, including stealth missions, confrontations with vampire hunters, or even an eventual showdown with her former master. So this can really blow up into something bigger, but I don't think I would introduce that in this particular quest. I think that would come later. Uh, Lysandra's character adds depth to the narrative, creating opportunities for diverse interactions and story development that enrich the overall in Shadows of the Forgotten Crypt. So if you use ChatGPT, you get these little summaries all the time, and sometimes that drives me nuts. I don't like those, but in this particular case, when you're writing, it's nice to have those summaries to kind of break down what you went over. And I don't mind it here, but when I'm just doing something basic, this drives me nuts. I wish you could turn that off, but in this case, I, I, I like it. So then I say, my this is me, At some point at the end of the venture, the vampire lord might or will make an appearance, and he wants to take back his fledgling vampire. This will become a cliffhanger moment, so at the very end of the adventure, he's going to come out and take her. The vampire lord indirectly disrupts Morwen's power and influence and becomes an unlikely savior for her. So the vampire lord kind of gets her out of that situation, but then she's back into her old problem. So then the content creator said okay so introducing the vampire lord at the end of the adventure as a pivotal character adds an unexpected twist and sets the stage for a compelling cliffhanger let's outline it so the final confrontation is at the near the end of the quest perhaps in the mist or right after the final battle with morwen the vampire lord makes a dramatic entrance his arrival could be forewarned by ominous signs or a sense of foreboding amongst the characters of lysandra uh, the Vampire Lord's primary objective is to reclaim her, his fledgling Vampirus. This encounter reveals more of Lysander's backstory and complex relationships between her and her former master, disrupting Morwen's power. So the Vampire Lord, either intentionally or as a byproduct of his presence, can disrupt Morwen's control over the crypt and his undead inhabitants. This interference might weaken Mor- Morwen to a critical point, inadvertently aiding the adventure. So what I thought about is this is a third level adventure. And if you get the right mix of people playing, maybe that encounter with Morwen is a little much. So having the vampire come in to claim his his fledgling and to disrupt Morwen might be the linchpin in the adventure where he actually helps them uh, defeat this guy. Uh, so there's a big battle between two powerful undead. So the cliffhanger moment could be moments of tension where the adventurers are caught in a tense standoff between Morin, the Vampire Lord, and possibly even Lysandra, each with their own agendas and powers. 
Choices and consequences might be that the players must make quick decisions that could significantly impact the outcome. Do they intervene? Do they take sides? Do they attempt to negotiate or use the chaos to their advantage? Kind of depends on the group, the GM, and the decisions that are made. So setting up for a sequel, the cliffhanger sets a stage for a sequel or follow-up adventure where these questions can be explored. The Vampire Lord emerges as a new potential antagonist or a very complicated ally, expanding the scope of the adventure's journey. So that's a really good twist. I mean, it's not bad. It's it's not too campy or cliche, and it throws a wrench into that regular kind of square box that we had earlier. So then we're going to build suspense. So we can hint about the Vampire Lord. It can be sprinkled throughout the adventure to kind of put in a little bit of foreshadowing. Like maybe she, uh, Lysander, kind of reflects on her time with him and kind of mentions him occasionally. Uh, the impact on players, this uh, twist could challenge the players' perceptions and force them to adapt quickly, highlighting the unpredictable nature of adventuring. The narrative depth of this would be the Vampire's Lord intervention might add depth to the story, creating a multi-layered conflict that extends beyond the immediate adventure. So this would really give you potential to expand. So the conclusion would be that the Vampire Lord disrupts the force in the climax for Shadows of the Forgotten Crypt, provides a thrilling conclusion to the adventures while opening a door to further exploration and intrigue in this dark and mystical world. And that's exactly how you want to pull your players in. Just going in there, killing the guy and getting out isn't always the, the way to go because it doesn't really bridge anything together. It just kind of a, you know, if you're going to do this as a one-time adventure, fine, whatever, no big deal. Don't even worry about it. But if you want to keep going or your players say, hey, I want to play some more, that's what you want. And this is the type of thing that you want to do to help spur that. And it doesn't have to be this complex. You just kind of leave a little bait out there and hopefully they take the bait. And if they're interested and they seem in invested in this, it might be something that you would want to uh, check out and, and get involved with. So I just put here as a comment to all that. I said, however, his evil and malignant behavior makes the adventurers concerned about the young vampirus. She regrets her condition and would seek to become free from her lord and the affliction. So that's one of the revelations that come, a potential revelation. So the moral quandary surrounding the young vampiress Lysandra now caught between her malevolent master and her own regretful existence. It deepens the narrative complexity. The situation presents the adventures with a difficult choice and the potential for new objectives. So this could have unfold such as regret and desperation. So she deeply regrets becoming a vampire and despises the control her master exerts over her. She longs for freedom and her affliction as and his influence. So she doesn't want to be under his thumb. Uh, adventurers discovery. So during their interactions or the final confrontations, the adventurers learn about Lysandra's true feelings and her desire to be free from her vampire curse. So they would find out eventually that she wants out. Moral decision. The adventurers are faced with a moral decision. Do they intervene on Lysandra's behalf against the vampire lord? Attempt to find a cure for her condition or... Respect the natural order and leave her to her fate, or kill her even. So it really depends on, you know, how things go in the adventure. So for potential scenarios, you can confront the Vampire Lord. Uh, you can choose to confront him later, either to free Lysander or challenge his malevolence. This could lead to a dramatic battle or a tense negotiation. Uh, quest for the cure. Players can go out looking for the cure. And maybe they don't find it. But if they do, they can embark on a new quest to find the cure, delving into ancient lore and seeking out rare mag magical remedies. So that could be an exploration thing. And then Lysandra's choice would be that to be given a moment to express her desires directly to the adventurers, potentially influencing their decision or leading them to an unexpected turn in the story. So she might do something weird or something. But anyways, for integrating this, you get uh, character development for Lysandra. It involves more of her mysterious background, her tragedy, her emotional depth, more narrative richness to this. Uh, setting up the, for the future, her fate, whether it involves seeking a cure or, or another confrontation, whatever it does, it gives you more future material for adventures, which is the whole point. 
The addition of this moral dimension concerning Lysandra's fate enriches the conclusion of Shadows of the Forgotten Crypt, and it can leave a lasting impression on the player, setting the stage for further adventures in this dark and complex world. So this is all like chat GPT stuff. This is not bad for, you know, basically chat GPT is a big database and it has a bunch of words and pictures and all kinds of crap in it. And it's just basically taking what you're saying and kind of reconstructing it into something you might want to use. So for homebrew and for, you know, a, a simple one shot or whatever, this is a really good tool for that. Uh, so the issues that were introduced at the end uh, might provoke another adventure to provide a cliffhanger moment so that the players might want more and to create a sense of needing closure. So this kind of goes more into that. Um, it's Lysandra will have this unresolved situation uh, torn between her cursed existence and the threat posed by her vampire lord. kind of leaves the players with more questions and concerns about her future, potentially, if they're invested in her. Uh, the Vampire Lord's agenda, his sudden appearance and interruption of the venture's quest against Morwen, introduce a powerful new antagonist with unknown motives and plans. Uh, Morwen's final moment, the outcome of the adventure's confrontation with Morwen, especially if influenced or interrupted by the Vampire Lord, can leave his fate ambiguous or open-ended. So maybe he didn't die. Maybe he was just kind of pushed back into another time or something. Who knows? But that's that's a little hokey, but at least it has room, a little wiggle room in case. Uh, so setting up for future adventures. So you have sequel hooks, character, more character development, and an expanded world. So you can use ChatGPT to kind of keep going if you wanted to. Um, engaging the, the player's desire for closure. So this is what I was saying earlier. They'll have this emotional investment. Uh, they'll want to have these emotional ties to NPCs and main characters like Lysandra and maybe um, be engaged morally. And, and it's, you know, like a complex thing, you know, it's not, not a simple thing. So the players might become more invested in the story and eager to see its resolution. Maybe that you can talk them into helping her and, and going further with the adventure. Uh, unanswered questions. So leaving key questions unanswered naturally creates a desire for closure and continuation among players. So you've got to play off that, whether it be guilt or just wanting to play again or, you know, or maybe they're enjoying the story. Who knows? So giving players the sense that their actions and decisions will significantly impact the unfolding story encourages them to continue the adventure to see the consequences of their choices. So that's cool. That's exactly what you'd want. So anyways, I go into here and I say, okay, now I got all this information. So now let's revise the outline, rewrite it. I want it to include the recent elements into the overall narrative, create detailed sections of perhaps six total chapters with chapter five and uh, as a crescendo and chapter six as the cliffhanger and the ending of the adventure for like an epilogue. So then you go and it gives me that basically that whole outline. I'm not going to read every single thing in here, but it talks about the the starting part where you go into Elden Ford, you go into the woods, you go towards the crypt, you go into the crypt and you learn about the stuff uh, that's happened. Then there's a battle, you have this final confrontation, and then you have this cliffhanger at the end. And in the epilogue, it says that you return to Elden Ford you can see that you've had some impact on the lives of the people in the town and the NPCs involved. Uh, so some loose ends for the future threads. So you hint at future adventures involving the Vampire Lord, Lysandra's fate, and maybe the deeper uh, secrets of the ancient civilization. So it gives you opportunity for character growth and planning for future challenges. So that's what really what uh, is a good end to that. So basically, I wanted to mention that just one more thing about this story is that I had to kind of delve deeper into Lysandra. So I didn't want to just have this ambiguous background. I kind of wanted to have a little bit more to it. So in her background, her predicament, this is some things that shaped her and changed her. And knowing this kind of helps you role play the character out. And it doesn't have to be this. So this would have been 
potentially what I worked into my own story. I don't necessarily want this to push this on the players or the GM, but I definitely would think about it. So the um, noble beginning. So Lysander was born into a noble family in a distant land. She grew up surrounded by luxury and privilege, but yearned for a life of purpose beyond the confines of aristocracy. Tragic turn. Her life took a dark turn when she was forcibly turned into a vampire by a powerful and cruel vampire lord. This traumatic uh, event shattered her world, turning her into a creature she loathed and feared. So life is a vampire. So with her new identity, she struggled to accept her new vampiric nature. She grappled with her predatory instincts, refusing to harm innocents despite her growing thirst. Escape from the Vampire Lord. So unable to bear the cruelty of her master and the prospects of an eternity as a vampire, Lysandra fled. Her escape marked her as a traitor in the eyes of her master, and it began a life of evasion and hiding. So she'd been running away for a few months at least. So she sought refuge. She went to Morrowind's lair, basically his crypt, to hide out started she clashed with them and then they have kind of like they form like an ally uh kind of a mutual respect and then she's still yearning for freedom so despite the agreement with morwin she yearned for freedom from her vampire curse and the tyranny of her former master but now she's got another one so this kind of gave her a little breathing room it doesn't really solve her problem so setting the stage for the future yeah we already kind of talked about that but basically conflict with the vampire lord Cure versus power, and then alliance with adventure. So those are things that have occurred. So then there's this evolving um, revelation where her relationship with the adventures kind of evolved. Initially cautious, maybe even a little hostile, and then she kind of grows to trust and rely on them as allies in her struggle against her vampire lord. So they have this shared enemy. Uh, she has inside information about the Vampire Lord, like where his lair is, his methods, that sort of thing. And then the moral dilemma is, you know, th do you help her or do you trust her? I mean, she's a vampire after all. I mean, do you want to help her find a cure or leave her? You know, it's kind of up to you. Uh, culminations and choices. So the final showdown reaches a climax with a confrontation against the Vampire Lord. Lysandra plays a critical role, perhaps delivering the final blow with the help of the adventurers. So the choice in the aftermath, Lysandra faces a pivotal choice. Pursue the elusive cure to her vampirism or ascend to the power vacuum left by her master. So these are things that might occur after the second adventure if you get that far. And this might shape how she turns out later. So impact on the world. So her decision will have significant implications not only for her but also the broader world. It could change the balance of power in the vampire community and impact the regions beyond. So we're going to leave room for expansion here. So there's with the unanswered questions, uh, there's closure for this immediate conflict with the Vampire Lord. It kind of leaves open questions about Lysander's future and the broader implications of her choices. Potential for further adventures. So Lysander's decision whether to seek a cure or take up her master's mantle opens up possibilities for further adventures exploring the consequences of her choice and its impact on the world. So I did all this, you know, just in case we want to go further. And so the events don't necessarily occur till the next adventure, but you got it kind of gives you a, a starting point. It also sets forward the narrative to continue and explain her background, and it kind of gets set up for the second adventure. And at the end of the adventure, the party should be at least level five. So you're kind of hoping they're at, by, at level five by then, by the first adventure. So um, Shadows of the uh, Crypt will lay the groundwork for her story, setting her background narrative for a subsequent adventure. The completion of the adventure will also see the party advancing to at least level five, and then this kind of tells you how it's structured. Uh, so you'll have like the introduction, revelations, alliance with her potentially, and then any moral ambiguity. Uh, so you, it kind of gives you the framework or the beginnings of formulating that that adventure so then there's ensuring the smooth transition so this is something that i really wanted to to make an important point at so ensure that the conclusion of shadows of the forgotten crypt naturally leads into the next adventure so it could be unresolved issues surrounding lysander and the vampire lord 
or maybe align the character's progression and development with the upcoming challenges in the overarching narrative. So kind of like powering them up to face the Vampire Lord, ensuring a seamless transition into the next phase of their journey. Maybe they find an artifact in the ancient uh, area that they find out would be effective against the Vampire Lord. I mean, there's all kinds of little little things, threads to pull in. So um, I asked for a name. So after all this time, after all this writing, I was like, we'll never name the Vampire Lord. That's kind of horrible. We don't have a name. So it gave me ten names, and I settled on two of these. There's Lord Draven Darkblood, which I kind of liked, and then there was Lucian Grimshade. So I kind of liking number two. I don't know what you guys think, but these are the other choices. Vladimir, kind of a cliche name. Count Varys, eh. Malachor doesn't sound like a vampire. Sirius Black Vein sounds like a ripoff from Harry Potter. Zarian the Nightmaster does not sound gothic or human. It sounds more like maybe Drow or something else. Darius Nocturne isn't too bad, but it sounds too casual. Raziel the Undying, maybe. And then Kaelin the Dark Herald, I don't think so. So there was only a few in there that really stood out, but I liked Lord Draven. Dark blood, a noble at one point, not quite a Count Strahd, not a total ripoff of Ravenlaw, but still. And then um, each of these names kind of have a mysterious thing, so I told it what I preferred, and then I said, "Yeah, let's do those two. I think those are the best." So what it did is it helped me reason why to take these names. So the Draven Dark Blood evokes a sense of ancient lineage and aristocracy bearing Draven, suggests a brooding, calculating nature, with while Dark Blood emphasizes his vampiric essence and possibly a sinister family history. Whereas Lucian kind of has this uh, shadowy, enigmatic type of feel. Lucian kind of has a classic timeless quality to the to the name, and Grimshade might imply the connection to the darker, more mysterious aspects of the vampire mythos. So I liked how it explained that. That's it, freaking fantastic. So that gives me a, a, a really good um, name, a memorable name, because I don't know how many times I've been in adventures, and I had a hell of a time thinking of a name and a good one that sticks. And I, I really like that. So helping you develop names for and places and things, uh, Chat GPT does a good job at that. Um, so I put unknown to the Lysandra, to Lysandra or the adventurers is part of her family background was that they had betrayed her to keep the vampire lord off their backs. So this is where things get ugly. And if you don't like this kind of stuff, you might want to stop watching. But essentially, her family sold her out. They told the vampire lord, leave us alone. Um, here is our daughter, you know. They basically sacrificed her so that they can keep on going because he was basically going after their assets and all kinds of stuff. So uh, the Sandra's betrayal, a hidden past. So this is really what went down. So the family's dark secret is Lysandra's noble family facing threats or manipulation from the vampire lord. They made a harrowing decision to sacrifice their own daughter to appease him, unbeknownst to Lysandra. So she doesn't know they did that. Uh, the deal. So the family's betrayal was part of a pact to protect their status and safety, a detail that was deeply buried within the family's secret history. The revelation of this is the truth about Lysander's transformation and her family's betrayal remains hidden initially. Clues to this revelation could be scattered throughout the adventures, especially the second one, uh, perhaps found in old family letters, diaries, or from other characters who are aware of the family's past. So then you get into the impacts, like what does it do? Like, you know, emotional turmoil, uh, moral dilemmas, deepening narrative, you know, you got all this stuff. So revealing. So revealing the betrayal would be a pacing thing. So the revelation can be paced throughout the adventures with the full truth coming to light only at a critical moment, heightening the dramatic impact. So Lysandra's reaction, how she deals with this betrayal, could be very pivotal pivotal to her character development in a, in a big moment. It might influence her decision or relationship with the adventurers, too. So it depends on what, what they find out. But it gives you a way to kind of foreshadow this in 
to the next adventure. Uh, you get more character development, of course, out of this. And now I've asked it, you know, I've done all this writing and stuff. Let's take a look. So this is the initial image. And I wasn't very happy with it because it looks very anime, kind of Japanese kind of character art. So I went, nah, not that. So then I did this one, which is a little better, but I didn't like the orientation. And it's still trying to show, you know, just this, even though I asked it to be uh, a vertical image. So then it came up with this one, which was kind of similar, but a little better, but not much. And then it came up with this one. I was like, yeah, that's the one. So this one's a lot better. I, I did take it into Photoshop and kind of edit it so it's not quite as uh, video game looking. It looks been fantastic. So this is her, kind of her character, and I'll take make tokens out of it and whatever. So then I, I went ahead and I said, okay, so let's make this vampire lord. So it made this, but if you look at this, I don't know what it was doing, but it's ugly. Like this, whatever this is, this teeth right here, it looks like a, I don't know, it's ugly. And that's the kind of crap that people get pissed off about with chat GPT and stuff. They're like, oh, that's AI, that sucks. Well, I wouldn't use the image. And if I did, I'd go into Photoshop and edit that out. Because that looks horrible. So I said, no, nah, that sucked, is basically what I said. So then it came back with this one, which is kind of the same. But it actually turned out better. I like the more of a white streak in here. And I did put retry the teeth as they look horrible. Please recreate the image above, but fix the fangs. The previous fangs were distorted and deformed with the wrong color. So I kind of went in and yelled at it. And the way to keep these consistent, to keep it kind of like it, you know, like it looked up there, was to kind of say, okay, that last image, let's let's redo that one. Same kind of prompts, but let's fix this part of it. So then I asked it to make these vampire bats, which I really liked. First take, didn't have any problems with that. And then I made this little collage here of the main characters for the story arc. Now, this wouldn't be something to be shown necessarily in the, the first adventure, maybe at the end. But this would be more of the stuff that you might put into a second part of the adventure. And then it made like a, a second collage of the original image. So this, I said, well, give me a, a prompt and let's see what it comes out. So, like. so it comes out like this, which I like both of these images, but I didn't like the bats. They look deformed. So what I might do is take this image and just superimpose it here and call it good. Because this looks more natural, more like uh, oil painting, which is the style I was looking for. And this is more 3D kind of animation almost type look. So I kind of like a blend between the 3D animation video game, but also oil painting. So I kind of like the combination. So these are kind of good for that. And then I tried to get it to make other iterations of the bats. I didn't mind this one so much, not too bad. And then it did this thing, which is way off. I mean, I like the black and white aesthetic and the red eyes. Kind of gives you that classic vintage look. But I really didn't ask for that. So I was like, "What? I didn't want black and white. So then it started doing this. And what this is, is after a while, it loses focus. And it starts to drift. So you see, I tried another attempt, and it totally did something completely different. And it even got worse. So when it does that, it's time to stop and restart. Because this is when it starts pissing you off and when you can't control it. So my advice about images is to take the images Maybe do a couple iterations, but after that, move on. Because you're going to end up doing 50,000 of these until you get the right thing. I don't think it's worth that. And to be quite honest with you, if you only have 25 or 30 of these per three hours, you don't want to waste it on one image. So I gave up on that. So I like the first one. I'm just going to edit this and make it look a little bit nicer. So then it kind of just kind of came down to, you know, no more of that. And then I kind of jump back into uh, the character creation part for Lysandra. And essentially, she has these noble origins, a family desperation. She transforms. Uh, she gets resentment for the power that she got. Her master's downfall, the crossroads. So in the wake of her master's destruction, Lysandra stands at a crossroads. She must choose between seizing control of the Dark Empire left behind or pursuing the fate 
or the faint hope of a cure to reclaim her lost humanity. So it might be at this point that she's too far gone, that she cannot find a cure, and she might just kind of settle in her role as a vampire. At that point, the players might be uh, challenged, maybe they have to take her out, or maybe they just leave her be. But nonetheless, she, at the second chapter, that would basically be the end of that and a life altered. So as the years pass, Lysandra's comfort with her vampire self grows, complicating her feelings about the cure she once sought so fervently. So she's kind of maturing into her role as a vampire. So Lysandra's story is not one that she shares lightly. So this kind of evolves and progresses. It's a warning, a lesson, and a tale of caution that's wrapped in the tragedy of a stolen life. Kind of pissed me off that her family sold her out. That was a kind of a cool little twist there. That kind of made things really, um, I don't know how to say, but it was really gnarly. So this is Morwen, or what I imagined him, what I asked to make something like this. So this is his, kind of looks like a vampire, so I kind of went for something different. So this is actually, that was the picture that it, that it came up with, which I like better. And then I kind of went into, you know, getting in more, to getting into the techniques to how to bring the adventures to life and all these other little things. And now I can go in and build the stat blocks and, and do all the encounters and that stuff. But this is all the storytelling aspects of it. And I even went into like when Lysandra in the beginning of the adventures, like when she visits town, like what does she do? Because there's rumors that, the Sandra made appearances near or in town. So this is one of the rumors that they come across. Lysandra occasionally goes into town after dusk and pretends to be a widowed noblewoman. She will occasionally ask for a drink or buy something from the trade shop. She can't really drink, but she pretends. Uh, she's kind of acting. So she usually generously overpays with strange coins and gemstones. So she's got all this weird loot from previous adventures that she took from the from the vault, but you know, like some of these coins haven't been seen in years, so people kind of get weirded out when she pays for her stuff. So that kind of gives them a clue that something's wrong. Uh, she's only been seen or remembered a few times by the townsfolk. That's because she's either charmed them or she didn't show herself very much. They do recall her beauty and her, her way she dressed. They definitely notice that she's not a native because she had a little bit different accent and she didn't look like the others. So she kind of dressed differently, you know, had a different mannerism, noble, that sort of thing. So we incorporate these kind of these like, uh, you know, these sort of like elements to kind of help build the rumors that may come up during the, the game. So the mysterious widow, she's got this guise of this noble woman that she kind of uses during her rare visits into town. Uh, she tries to blend in, but also maintains a veil of, of mystery. So she does, like, charm people and stuff. Um, she interacts with the townsfolk as a way to um, kind of make things more memorable as what she was like when she was alive because she kind of misses it. So she visits a local tavern for a drink or goes to the shop, but the encounters are brief, and they kind of leave an impression because uh, – she leaves this overpayment and the people are kind of like, what the hell? So she overpays for everything and it, it just weirds people out. And she thinks she's doing a service. Really, she's kind of giving herself away, but she thinks she's helping out by giving them extra money. Uh, rumors and descriptions. So townsfolk will discuss sightings of this mysterious woman commenting on her striking beauty and unusual attire. They note her foreign demeanor, uh, sparking curiosity and speculation. So the sparse recollect recollections of her visits are infrequent, and they're enough that the details are kind of scarce, and the recollections will vary. So some will remember her being somber, while others recall only that she's kind of mysterious. Um, so this might give some little bit of foreshadowing um, as you progress in the adventure, the first adventure, and kind of get an idea that there's this woman that comes to town occasionally. So this, uh, players that are careful and kind of attuned to that sort of thing might pick up on these details and start to begin to draw connections to a larger narrative. So there will be the player or two that kind of go, okay, this woman's got something to do with the story. So the initial mystery is this noble woman. Uh, through conversations with NPCs, you find out little things. You get these little hints, role-playing opportunities. 
or they might interact with Lysander in disguise. Uh, it might create an intriguing role play scenario without immediately revealing your true nature. Uh, so it links to the main plot. Eventually, clues from these town visits could lead players to discover her connection to Morwen and the true reason behind her forays in the town. So what's really um, another thing about this kind of sad is that she she spies on the town uh, for Morwen. That's her duty. But her personal motive for doing this is not only to remain in his favor and protection, but she's kind of testing herself amongst the living. So she kind of wishes to be normal again. She feels kind of sad, depressed. Uh, she doesn't like her situation. So he used, she uses her in-person visits to kind of remind her of her fading mortality. And, you know, she was once human, and she kind of wishes she still was. So this kind of goes into that a little bit and her struggle with her new reality and the integration into the adventure. So these are little details that will help you shape the NPCs and their motivations and how they fit in and why they fit in. And having this big of a story arc may be a little much for a one shot, but if you wanted to run this as a campaign for like a homebrew thing, this would be perfect for that. And that's kind of the purpose of this. I wish I could turn this into a commercial module. I think it would be well written. My only problem is the art and getting people to buy off on that because I don't think they would buy the, they would like the art too much. But nonetheless, the story is pretty decent. Uh, it's not too cliche. It does have emotion and, and role playing aspects. And then I just told it to summarize everything in which it did and then make an epilogue and then, you know, start tying into that cliffhanger. So there was a lot here to go over. I didn't mean to drag that on, but I wanted to share with you the process of how that happened. So hopefully that helps you guys a little bit with what could be done with ChatGPT. The other thing is building your, your content. So if I go to the back end and go to edit, if I edit this GPT, I have some instructions where basically it's going to be focused on generating content for Fantasy Grounds. It's going to focus on plain text, rollable lists, D&D, NPC stat blocks, uh, adventure templates. All the outputs should be in plain text, no HTML, bold text, no code blocks, nothing like that. And then I give it the um, link for the, um, this is for the SRD. So all that content, when I try to keep most of that out of the the IP realm of, of uh, Wizards of the Coast. And then I gave it these URLs, which are addresses on the Atlassian guide that talks about NPCs and encounters, the effects automation if we need to, and then just the generic D&D 5e rule set in Fantasy Grounds. So then these things here are templates of the adventures the coding for our any sort of wording or verbiage. There's a rollable list. There's a D&D 5e stat block templates. And then there's the player race PC template. So I'm still kind of building this. But essentially, all those building blocks are in place. So if I ask ChatGPT to make the stat block for a given creature, then it will. It, it will do that. And it will do it in the right or close to the the format so this is just the beginning of of a you know potential uh, adventure that you could run and you don't have to build it all at once and what's nice is it will kind of store it in this conversation but if you do want to download it ever you can archive these things and there's an option in your settings under your account where you can export all of the data i don't know if it'll do the images but it does all the text so if you do a whole bunch of work and you decide that you don't want to use ChatGPT anymore, you'll have all your text in HTML format. So it'll export all the conversations that you have, and it will, you know, it'll, it'll give you that that luxury to download your information out of here and be done with it. So if you try it for a few months and you get sick of it, you can always go back and download all the text, cancel your account, and still use the content that you generated which I think is a good thing. Uh, so, you know, I've done other things, like I made like the scorpion kind of 
NPC kind of also a player character race. So, I mean, there's so much you can do. Uh, I made some, uh, what's this? Oh, here's another um, iteration. So these were more like the, kind of like a scorpion creature thing. And here's the stat blocks. And so you can do all kinds of really cool, um, you can do some really cool stuff. I made this Skyborn race, which is kind of like a celestial uh, offshoot. Here's another iteration of the, of this uh, kind of like the scorpion humanoid thing. That almost looks like a Pathfinder picture, which is interesting. But anyways, I hope that helps you guys a little bit. I know that was a lot to grab onto, but the main thing is if you have a paid account with ChatGPT and you go to the explore part, which is usually down at the bottom. Let's see if I can go back there. So there's this explore GPT. So if you click on that, now they have that store now where you can go in and buy these things you can use them i got to kind of look into this more uh there's stuff for writing stuff for images stuff for productivity there's stuff for research programming education lifestyle there's just all kinds of crap that you can do with this but i'm usually f using it for writing and adventure stuff but you can do a lot and you can search this but then you have your own gpts the ones that i've created and that's all these here and they all have different reasons for them. So I have a, a Fantasy Grounds video timestamp thing. I got a social media manager, a Pathfinder assistant, got a quest maker, uh, a transcript scribe thing that takes like YouTube videos and converts them into text. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff. You can make your own custom ones. You just create, click on this create, you, you give it a name, you give it a description, you ask it what you want it to do, and we'll make these conversation starters. And then if you have any documentation you want to upload, you got to click on code interpreter and then upload your files, which would be your PDFs, your reference documents, anything like that. And then you would save it. Nine times out of 10, you'd probably use it for yourself or you can share a link with your friend. But then if you want to sell it publicly, like I've done with a couple of them, uh, you have to make sure that the content is in there is not copyright. Kind of kind of come up with your own plan of how you want to execute it and come up with something ingenious. So something that people want or need. And you would be surprised. Maybe I think you only make like a penny or something, but after you know you get so many pennies, it'll add up. So I'm not sure what the cost pricing structure is going to be, but the store just kind of opened today. So I'm not sure how that's going to play out. I got to look into it, but it's a store that you can sell custom GPT. So like that story generator, maybe I could sell something like that. Maybe not the exact one that I have, but something like it. Uh, you might have a Gothic horror story writer and basically it pulls on like Edgar Allan Poe and Alfred Hitchcock and whoever these writers were to inspire your own work. Maybe it's like Call of Cthulhu stuff or you know, whatever it might be, but there, there could be a, a market for it or a niche. You never know. And all it takes is the correct questions and you can go through and kind of go through your plan before you make this. And then you can upload it, organize it, refine it and keep it private or you can list it or you can even uh, sell it if you, you know, if you want to sell it online, but there's an upgrade plan now and I'm not trying to, market or sell for them but i have this plus plan but if you're going to do a team like a small group of writers or something like that you could upgrade it so that you guys can create and share your gpts at work and that kind of thing but anyway so that's enough of that you guys have a good week uh hopefully you guys got a little bit out of this and uh you know let me know what you guys think in the comments uh, if you guys are getting tired of chat GPT or you think I should be doing something else, I, I definitely entertain that idea. I'm getting a little burned out on it myself, but I do like the content that's coming out. And it, and it's kind of, you can see over here on the left, I've done a lot. And a lot of this stuff is either social media or like I've done like these weird kind of witch kind of spider thingies where I'm trying to come up with some kind of villainous or I'll have like a fantasy grounds kind of a, I got one that does the effects automation. So this one is in our Discord. So if you ever wanted to write, uh, you know, some kind of effect for a fifth edition character, 
Uh, generate an effect for a D and D player's action tab. So that's a, a a question starter, but I don't think that's a very good start because it really doesn't doesn't tell it what exactly you want. But nonetheless, I could say something like you know, um, let's say, uh, please create the bar. This is barbarian rage. Yeah, now it's it's yelling at me. I give you an example. So I said, give me the barbarian rage effect, uh, just because that's one in the, that used to plague people. It's kind of common now, but this would help if you made like custom content. So it it'll it's looking at the back end because I provided it with the you know the different um, syntax syntax and stuff for it. So it would basically give you um, the breakdown of it, how it works, how you might code it. So there's the actual um, verbiage. So it even tells you like here's the the effect right here. It wrote it out just like that. So you can copy and paste that in the fantasy ground. So that's, you know, just kind of one of the uses that you can get out of these things, you know, depending on, on what your needs are. So you'd copy the code, you know, go into fantasy grounds, make a character, put that in there, you know, and, and, and use it. So that that's one good use for it, I guess. So, you know, for auxiliary tool, but anyways, you guys take care.